Good afternoon. Welcome to a typical November afternoon, 75 degrees and sunny. Isn't that amazing? So the sun did come up this morning. How about that? So uh, welcome, everybody. We're streaming this, too, so we've got people online watching. And of course, we're recording it. So if somebody misses it and they'd like to see it, uh, please remind them of that. This will be available. Uh, wow, lots has happened since we last saw each other. And the world is, seems to be changing. As we know, it changes all the time. But this, this afternoon, we're going to have a look from uh, Sean and also from Riley. And you all know both of those folks well. Uh, this is a team that's better than MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News combined. <laughs> and PBS, let's throw in PBS as well. So they're going to really provide some commentary all the way to the national level, aren't you, in terms of what we think might happen. And you have to remember these are not necessarily the opinions of the university. These are the opinions of this folks that read the paper and understand this institution and think about what might happen and what could play out over time. And uh, let's look at the state revenue picture. Uh, so this will be, there'll be some dark moments. I'll just tell you right now, I'll give you a heads up that the news is, is difficult. But as we've always done, we've been very open with what we know and what we think could happen and how things could play out. So uh, Sean, are you leading off? And then I'll come back in and do, do the closing. And uh, Riley, I know, will help Sean along the way. Okay, it's all yours. Whether you're in this room or you're watching via the interwebs, um, I want to say that First and foremost, as divisive and heated as this campaign has been over the last, see, it seems like it's been going on for years, right? But at least 16 months, 18 months, that we can all at least agree that we want to advance Pittsburgh State University and not for ourselves. That we want to advance Pittsburgh State University because we recognize that Pittsburgh State University is, is the avenue for opportunity to thousands of people every year. So, I have said this so often, I know in these rooms or similar rooms, that we too often put so much emphasis in Washington, D.C. and the next in Topeka, but we need to flip that on its head and focus here. And I still think that's the case. And I think that's the case no matter who wins the presidential election or who controls things in Topeka. Now, Topeka and D.C. can make our job more difficult and more challenging, but it doesn't change our mission. It doesn't change the fact that we are here to provide transformative experiences for our students and for our community. So, with that said, that's my caveat, because I know that there are a lot of, there are a lot of different viewpoints. And I, I will say, I think even on this campus, there are probably a lot of different viewpoints about who should have been president and, and, and why the person who won won and all those sorts of things. What I will say is that we will continue on the way we have continued on. Now, what does it mean for us that Donald Trump is now going to be the president of the United States? I don't know that we have a concrete answer for that yet. Nobody has been able to figure out this entire cycle, right? The conventional wisdom has been conventionally wrong every time. And so for me to stand up here and tell you that I know exactly what a Trump presidency is going to look like for the next four years, whether that's generally or specifically with regard to higher education, I don't know. I'll say I think there's the potential that there could actually be uh, some things that we've been dealing with regulation-wise that may actually get lessened, right? Uh, FLSA, we've been dealing with that as a challenge for us. There's a good chance that a Trump administration will roll back the FLSA regulations, or they'll change them, modify them. But it won't happen immediately. He's not going to be president until January 20th, and it could take months after that if he is to do that, but I think there's a good chance of that. Hey, Sean. I can jump in real quickly on that. I recently, uh, again, Riley Scott, thanks for having me. Sorry to jump right thanks in. Thanks for being here. Thank, happy <laughs> to be on campus. Uh, I, yesterday I spoke with Senator Moran's staff about this very issue, uh, and they know it's, it's a priority for universities across the state. Uh, the, the rule goes final December 1, uh, and then as Sean said, obviously uh, Trump does not become president until January 20th, so there's at least two months in there. They said their best guess right now, and again, who knows what a Trump presidency looks like. I don't think we know, I don't think Donald Trump knows what a Trump <laughs> presidency looks like, which is scary in some respects. But they said best guess right now is Trump's Secretary of Labor 
probably says, we are not going to enforce this new rule that's on the books, and then they'll engage in going through the rulemaking process again to remove it from the books. So at that point, uh, if they could always just not enforce a rule, uh, which happens frequently, uh, not always on uh, high profile issues like this. Um, but if they choose to do so, it's still on the rule book, and if there is a if there's a Democrat president in four years or at some point later on in the future, they could then choose to enforce the rule at that point. So that just to shed a little bit of light, again, uh, some of this is a bit of a guess. Uh, being better than Fox News and MSNBC and CNN, is that's a low bar considering everyone <laughs> got it wrong, uh, but, but appreciate the compliment nonetheless. You so might as well stay stood up because I'm sure you're gonna, I'm going to need more help. <laughs> okay. So. Um, this is like Brooks and Shields. Those are my favorites, so I'm okay. not going to say who's who. I like PBS. That's how much of a geek I am. I, I was watching PBS on, Jan on that last Tuesday into Wednesday. But um, no, I think the truth is there's a lot of un uncertainty. And I think, you know, we've heard things people might have said, or Donald Trump may have even said at some point, that he was going to get rid of the Department of Education. Now, how many of you actually think that's going to happen? Right. The truth is, is that whatever, whatever upheaval there is, as far as, like, as Riley said, I'm not even sure he knows what he's going to do yet. I will say there, we have to have some hope and faith in the institutions that we have created as a government in our Constitution. It's not just as easy as one person making a fiat decision. And so I think that should give us some comfort and some hope. Um, there's some possibility there could be increased infrastructure investment, right? That's popped up. That would be a good thing, right? So I think, I think what I want us to do is what I've said all along, which is try not to focus so much of our attention on Washington, D.C., and focus as much as possible here at home in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh State University, and then a little bit more at the state level. So uh, here in a, a few minutes, we're going to talk about, as uh, Dr. Scott uh, indicated, uh, there, there is some really troubling and challenging news with regard to the financial picture of the state. We all know this. Again, we all want to tell you the truth. We've always done that. We, want it. we know that you can handle the truth, and we can have honest conversations. So we're going to talk about that in a second. What I want to do here for a moment is give you a little bit of sense of optimism about what's happening in Kansas right now. I will tell you that I am confident in saying that we have started the turn of the corner. This session will represent the start of a turn of the corner. Now, I give you a little bit of caution in getting too excited about how fast it's going to happen because I think it's a country mile and not a city block. Okay, we've gotten ourselves behind at least one if not multiple eight balls and we're going to have to get around that. But I want you to have some hope in the fact that there has been some significant changes that have occurred with regard to the composition of the legislature which will result in changes in policy and, and law. So this is what the picture looked like in 2016. Forty senators uh, compositions break down just by party of 32 Republicans and 8 Democrats. One of the things that I want to make sure that you all understand is, and I think I've talked about this before, how many of you have been in one of these where you've heard me say something about there being four parties in Topeka? One of those parties, if you recall what I said, that was not just Republicans and Democrats. It's Democrats, moderate Republicans, conservative governing re Republicans, and I don't know, what's the nice way to put it? Hard right. Hard right, right Republicans. Right. Yeah. There is almost, the, there, this election represented almost the elimination of the hard right Republicans. Significant shift. So just from a partisan composition, it went just one extra Democrat. So it didn't look like it changed that much. But when you look at the change, when you add in the purple dots, the purple dots are the moderates, the red are we're just going to, we're lumping them all in as conservatives, and we know that these are a change in those type of conservatives. And, and believe me, this is not an exact science. Riley and I sort of just have to kind of guesstimate a little bit because it does depend on exactly what they're voting on, but this is a rough estimation. Here's what it looks like now. The you, truth is, is that a, a change occurred in Kansas, a moderation occurred in Kansas, a pendulum swing is occurring in Kansas. It just occurred primarily in August, not in November in the primary elections. You'll notice there are combined more blue dots and purple dots than there are red dots. You can see the, the number breakdown there at the bottom. There are 19 conservatives, uh, whereas previously there are 27 for the last four years in the, in the Kansas Senate. And I think significantly, one of those purple dots is uh, most likely to be elected uh, into Senate leadership. Uh, 
they, they have their elections December 5th. That's Jeff Longbine, who represents Emporia, also Emporia State. He's been a, a pretty strong advocate for uh, higher education, particularly the regional uh, institutions. Uh, he's likely to be elected vice president, which would have never happened uh, four year, the, the previous four years. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a good indication that, uh, uh, that there is a, a, a tide turning. And as I said, don't hold us exactly to these numbers because there's going to be times where they vote differently. What I will say is that Riley and I have some quick math all the time. It's, the numbers are 21, 63, and 1. 21 in the Senate, 63 in the House, and one governor. And there's, so, there, some of these, they don't know if they're a red dot or a purple dot at all, particularly in the House, maybe more so in the Senate. But once we get to the House, it's a little bit more of a guesstimate. And one of the things on there I will say is that another thing, as we think about going into the next session, is we have about a 35% turnover. We have 35% new faces in Topeka, which does present its own challenges, right? Because these are folks who are coming in largely thinking they know everything and they're going to realize really quickly they don't know very much. Including the House member who represents the university right. as well. Yeah. I mean, hey. she's not been there before. She has hey, not. Sean? Uh, the other night we visited with the Student Government Association and one of the senators, one of the student senators said it seems to him, that's a really interesting question or statement, that the nation went one direction and Kansas went another. You know, it's an interesting point. Uh, Chris Kelly uh, sent me a text last night and said, hey, I just heard about Kansas on All Things Considered and they were talking about the uh, substantial swing to moderation mm -hmm. in Kansas. And he pointed out it's nice to have a story on the national news that doesn't talk about being broke in Kansas. <laughs> and I agree. Yeah. But the fact that there are going to be folks from outside of Kansas who are seeing this as, uh, as a significant movement, a significant political movement. I have said for a long time the center point in Kansas is not where we have been living. The center point in Kansas is this common sense conservatism, right? It's the Eisenhowers and the Doles and that sort of thing. That's the center point. We're conservative, I think, as a state, but we're not ideologically conservative rigid. So I think you're seeing this here. And actually, you could further break this down. If you're to use my four-party analogy, it probably is now, uh, Ryan and I were just talking about that, depending on exactly how you break this down, it's probably 16 governing conservatives. So that's the, okay, they're folks that are in leadership now, but they're, but they're willing to work to, to find solutions. But Jake LaTurner. Would Jake LaTurner is a, a governing good, conservative probably. A good example of that. Mm -hmm. 16, I know, so there's some rumbles out there. Some people aren't so sure about that. But I will tell you, in Topeka, <laughs> in Topeka he, that's is, the perception. he is 16, 3, and 12. There's probably about three of that hard right <laughs> left. They lost at least six, if not seven, members. It was a significant, a significant change. In the House, last session you had 98 Republicans and 27 Democrats. If you were to break down now just by party, the Democrats gained 13 seats uh, here last week. So it's 85 Republicans, 40 Democrats. If you look at 2016, what the composition was, and you do this by this really rough <laughs> inter-partisan breakdown, ideological breakdown, you had 75 conservatives. Of that, roughly probably 25 were, or 20 were kind of Ultra-right? Maybe a little bit less, 12 20, to 15. 12 yeah. to 15 were ultra-right of the 75, 23 moderate, 27 Democrats. Here's what it looks like now. Look at this change. Remember the number 61? No one of those buckets has 61 dots in it. 63. Six, yes, exactly, 63, <laughs> like I said, Riley. 63. That's why I'm here. <laughs> If they don't have 61, they don't have 63. Yeah, that's true. Hard to get to 63 Just without saying. 61. I'm, not, I'm actually not wrong. There isn't 61. Uh, there's not 63. What that means, that any one of those buckets, any one of those, those lanes is going to have to pick up votes from another lane in order to get anything picked past. So what that forces is what government is supposed to do, which is compromise. That forces deal making. That forces horse trading. That forces that sort of thing. And of those conservatives, you see that the conservative, if you just say broadly, the governing and right-wing conservatives lost 20 seats in the House. So, and, and actually, a significant brunt of those losses were on the, the furthest right flank of the Republican Party. 
And a lot of those losses, as you mentioned earlier, came in August as opposed to November, just this past week. <clears throat> right. Now, the, 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 the plus 13 Democrats happened in November, but you had uh, a significant loss among conservative Republicans in August. Mm -hmm. Sean, we talked about 63, and we talked yeah, about 21. Or 61, but 63 61, is the right number. Right. Yes, okay. uh, it might be a good time to talk about the one as well, and, and it, its relation to national politics, which is something that's been kicked around quite a bit. Um, I, not to start any rumors or anything like that, but it's, it's certainly been in the press and speculated. There's a chance Governor Brownback is appointed to something in the Trump administration, which means it, Lieutenant Governor Brown, or excuse me, Lieutenant Governor Collier could become Governor Collier within the next two or three months at some point. Um, so that there also, and this doesn't necessarily impact us in terms of legislation at the state level, uh, but there's certainly been a lot of speculation and just this afternoon uh, reports in the national media that Chris Kobach, our Secretary of State, could be named Attorney General for the entire United States Attorney General. Uh, he was a <coughs> Trump supporter uh, from day one. I think he was the only, I know he was the only statewide uh, elected official who endorsed Trump uh, in the primary uh, and obviously has staked out some pretty high profile positions on, uh, on hot topics. Uh, so there is an interchange between what happened at the national level and what could potentially happen uh, here at the state level and, and just in terms of who's in, uh, who's in the governor's seat come this next session and, and beyond. Obviously, yep. Governor Brownback is term limited. He can't run for re-election anyway. Uh, we would have a new governor starting uh, in January of 2019, regardless of what happens, whether there's an appointment or not. Uh, but, but we could have a new gover governor sooner than uh, two years from now. And I, and I did meet with the governor just a few weeks ago and, and uh, before all this played out, of course. And, and it's, it's clear he recognizes the, the depth of the, of the budget situation that you're going to cover here in a few minutes. And I, and I perceived a sense of more openness to solutions that we hadn't been considering before. And, and I think that speaks to how deep the, uh, the deficit is and how deep the revenues mm -hmm. have dropped for him to begin to think about additional solutions that before now he's, he's taken off the table. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, so Riley mentioned too that probably everyone has thought of already because they've seen it in national media reports and all that sort of thing, but with uh, Secretary of State Kobach, Governor Brownback, the potentiality for them to depart Kansas uh, sooner than they had maybe planned uh, prior to the election, uh, which would obviously then mean a Governor Collier, probably, I guess it would automatically, and then a new Lieutenant Governor. Mm -hmm. The other person who you may have seen is getting thrown around is Congressman Pompeo. Congressman Pompeo is getting thrown around. He's uh, the uh, third district? Fourth district. Fourth district, which includes Wichita area. Uh, he is a West Point graduate and uh, Harvard, Law. Harvard Law graduate. There's some discussion of him as some sort of maybe Secretary of the Army, something like that, which would obviously mean then we have an open seat in Congress, which would have to have a special election. Special election would be ran by the Secretary of State, which may be a completely new person. So we could have, within the next uh, six months to a year, some really significant changes from a leadership standpoint statewide. Or possibly none. Or none. Or maybe right. zero. It could be so, status quo. No, so very speculative. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we've already kind of went over the legislative composition shift and, that, and how I want you to rock out of here with some hope that we are heading toward a corner change. Now, I think it's like steering the Titanic and not like one of those zero-turn radius mowers that the guys used to make our lawns look so great. It's like the Titanic. I shouldn't use the Titanic because it sank. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah. well, we'll say the Queen Mary. How about that? Um, a really big ship takes a little while to turn. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad analogy. Um, I acknowledge it. <laughs> Riley didn't we we to, didn't catch that. And, and Riley didn't even have that. to tell me that that was wrong in front of you all. We so, should have taken that out in rehearsal. <laughs> I know. We didn't catch that. Uh, we've talked about the impact of potential presidential appointments, legislative leadership changes within the, uh, within the uh, House, within the two chambers. Riley talked about the chance that a vice president of the Senate could very well be Jeff Longbine from Emporia who is a friend of not only higher ed, but understands regional institutions representing Emporia. That would be a really good thing for us. More than likely, President Susan Weigel will remain in her presidency uh, as the president of the Senate. Majority leader, 
Uh, who all has thrown in for that so far? It's most likely Jim Denning. A majority leader will, will certainly change because the sitting majority leader, who, Terry Bruce from Hutchinson, lost his primary to a more moderate challenger. So uh, we'll Actually, in fact, uh, uh, former Senator Bruce, or nearly former Senator Bruce, actually was beaten by a gentleman who was the president of a community college. Which community college? Hutch, Hutch Hutchinson Jericho. Community College. Another person who understands higher education issues. Maybe even better than Terry Bruce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't have to be as cautious now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, there's going to be significant changes in leadership uh, in the Senate. In the House, there's going to be significant leadership changes. The Speaker of the House, Ray Merrick, you'll recall Ray Merrick is one of those, uh, it was lead in leadership that helped to ensure that certain things weren't even discussed in the House, right? Uh, can care expansion was not allowed to even have a hearing under Speaker Merrick. We're going to have a new speaker. And if you look at the composition of things, you've got to assume that more than likely that speaker is probably going to be less conservative. Right now, we, are, we think that the three most likely candidates are Representative uh, Ron Reichman, Jr., who is from the Kansas City area. He was appropriations chair this last year. Uh, we've worked with him very well. Sensible, governing conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, second would be uh, Gene Vickery. Gene Vickery actually has some connections to Pittsburgh State, at least has a son who graduated from Pittsburgh State. Gene Vickery's from Lewisburg. Uh, he's currently majority leader in the House. And the third is Russ Jennings, Russ Jennings who is Southwest Kansas. Southwest Kansas, and he is from that moderate sort of purple uh, mm -hmm. portion of the Republicans. So I think that uh, regardless of who wins, there's going to be a shift toward more, more moderation within the Speaker's office. Uh, I, think there's, I think that, uh, I don't know, can we, I don't know if we can speculate. Should we speculate? Up to you. I don't know, maybe we should. <laughs> uh, there will be moderate, more moderation. I think that there is a good chance that that means that there will be discussion. We almost are 100% positive there's going to be discussions about revenue enhancements. For sure, with regard to LLC, the change in that, the governor has even alluded to the fact that he probably would not even oppose them doing that. Um, I know many of us think, well, I wish he wouldn't have opposed it two years ago, but we are where we are, and so we'll turn the corner now. Um, I think that you're going to have probably uh, throughout the entire leadership a shift. Uh, with tax chair, I think that there's going to probably be at least a debate about can care expansion. I think it probably depends on what happens with Obamacare a little bit, right? Right. But. <laughs> It would be hard to expand the ACA if the ACA no longer right. exists. But. But, that, but that's probably unlikely given what comments President-elect Trump has made to this point. Right. So <clears throat> I can't stall anymore. I guess we've got to <laughs> talk about this. So I know that all of you are very in tune. You, you, you do what we always encourage you to do, which is to stay informed. And so I think a lot of this will be redundant. Um, but. I want to make sure that we're the ones that are telling you for sure that this is what's, what has occurred in confirming some of these things. Last week, the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group came out with their consensus revenue estimates for the rest of this, for the remainder of FY17, FY18, and FY19. Now, keep in mind the reason why they do FY18 and 19 is because we will be heading into another two-year budget cycle. We are in the midst of the second year of a two-year budget cycle, which means that next session they will be debating fiscal years 18 and 19. So what we learned from that new consensus revenue estimate, uh, and even prior to that, what we knew for sure was that we, had, we were about 80 plus million dollars off of receipts to this point. What the consensus revenue estimating group has now told us is that they expect that we're going to be $350 million off of original projections for FY18, 17. 17. For FY18, uh, they are, projecting a $444 million drop, which is about 7.4%, and then in FY19, a slight increase. So that means that we are, the one thing we know for sure is that we are likely going to be dealing with less money. And so obviously, uh, there's the potential for that having an impact. It will have an impact on us in some way. The challenge we have is that the governor has not yet said how that's going to impact any state agencies. When the governor and the, the, when the state budget director had the press conference, they said the governor has no intention right now to do any allotments. 
and is going to suggest to the legislature a, uh, a, a rescission budget, but likely with no direction as to cut. So that's the truth. That's where we are. It's not pretty. It's challenging. Uh, we're not walking into this with all the, the, the attempt at some rosiness that I tried to point, paint you a second ago. Uh, we're not walking into this blind. We know that this is going to be a very, very challenging session. And that we're not, we are likely not going to get out of this current fiscal year without another cut. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges is when we get there, January 9th is the first day of session this year, we are six months into the fiscal year 17. Any law, typically any law that's passed during that budget, or during that, during that session becomes law July 1 of that calendar year. That's the start of the new fiscal year. So for instance, if there is a tax increase on LLCs, if they close the loophole on that, <clears throat> it wouldn't start until at the very earliest July 1. However, when you're dealing with tax policy, we all pay taxes on a calendar year basis, not a fiscal year basis. They typically delay that another six months, and those tax increases wouldn't start until January 1 of 2018. So we, it's a delay to, on the best case of six months, but most likely a year. So any sort of revenue enhancements probably don't start until January 1 of 2018, which just puts further pressure on budget cuts. We also have laying out there um, the Gannon Supreme Court decision, which could either have zero impact or we don't even know. It could be 300 million, could be 800 million. And those are annual numbers. Those are annual numbers. Um, and obviously at that point then, that pie, that there is already a lot of scarcity within that revenue pie, it shrinks by three to 800 million dollars. Now, we don't know. The court may not make a decision on it. And so we just have to be aware of it. We have to be uh, at least somewhat prepared for the potentiality. We have to be, have reality glasses on with regard to that. Um, I will tell you that what I want, again, to reiterate is the fact that I think you can take some comfort in the notion that there will be a majority in both chambers who want to find solutions. Now, they may not be exactly the solution any one of us in this room wants, but they will have to find, they will be tilted towards solution as opposed to ideology as much. And I think that matters. I think that gives us some level of comfort, although I've, I've often said, the joke I've said is that I feel like there would not be real change in this state until there was rubble. There still might be more rubble, and we might still have to work through it, work around it, walk over it. But I think that, that we have some hope in the sense that there is at least a coalition, a majority of folks, who want to figure out a way to rebuild it. And so, I, I don't want you to walk out of here dismayed, or any more dismayed at least. Maybe you walked in here dismayed, but I don't want you to walk in here out of here worse. I'd like to see at least this much improvement in, in the way that your outlook is on where we stand as a state. Um, so that's the things that we're dealing with. That's the reality that we know we're going to walk into in January, and, uh, and we're, we're preparing for it. So even more than ever, I want to encourage all of you to do these things. Stay informed. Be connected. Don't ever hesitate to shoot me an email. Call me if you have a question. I may not be able to get you an answer right then, but I guarantee you I'll try my best to, to find you an answer. Um, and talk to our legislators. Um, one of the things I will say to you about, if we think about the federal level, there's one party in control now of the White House and of Congress. So if things don't get done, there's responsibility to be laid there, right? And I would hope that they recognize that. And I think you will see in the leadership with Senator McConnell, uh, Representative Ryan, they've indicated as much. We know if we don't do things, we're going to be held accountable in two years. Okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind here. That is a check. That's the way that things are so supposed to be. Number two is, on the local level, and even more important on the local level, is that you talk to Senator LaTurner, and you talk to soon-to-be Representative Moran, Mernan, and you tell them how you feel. And you tell them how important it is that Pittsburgh State University succeed and not just limp by. Because you know that what's important 
is opportunity. And you know that what we do here is we help to extend that ladder of opportunity in the American dream to people in this region. And it's important that they continue to fund us. And we do, we take a dollar and turn it into three here. Not exact. John's looking at me like, what are you saying? <laughs> um, I guarantee you there's nobody who better uses state funding than Pittsburgh State University in the way that we impact lives. And so stay involved. And the last appeal I will give you is this, is that I told you that the least emphasis you should put in is in D.C., followed by Topeka. The most emphasis you should put is locally, and we're going to have city commission elections before too long. We're going to have at least one opening. And I would bet there's somebody in this room who may even be a good candidate for city commission. There is no more important governing body in this entire state for people at Pittsburgh State University than the Pittsburgh City Commission. And I am unabashed in saying that. So. All right. All right. Wow. Very good. That was pretty thorough, wouldn't you say? Uh, Barbara, maybe we should provide one hour of graduate credit in political science to that. I mean, I thought that was a really good look at what we're seeing. Uh, not only the numbers we know, but also this sense of where we think things might go. And I think you can see we've got a great team representing us there, uh, although the news, certainly from Topeka, continues to be very, very worrisome. Uh, I'd, I'd make a few comments in closing, then we'll see what kind of questions that people would have uh, for us. Uh, first of all, I'd address the budget situation. You know, uh, Sean talks about the glimmer of hope, and it is important to note there, there, are some, there are some elements of that that clearly look like there's some different solutions coming. But as Riley pointed out, those solutions are out in the out months and years, mm -hmm. and that's, that's our concern. So we are in a, we're in a very difficult budget situation right now. We've got to live through a pretty serious dip. Now, many of you were here in 2008, 2009, uh, we went through a very difficult time. We had a 14%, I think a 13% and a 1% budget cut. We were almost at uh, almost a $40 million of an allocation from the state of Kansas. And John, we're getting close to 32 if we get a cut that we think could happen uh, this year as we finish out the year. So that's a huge difference. It gets you down to about FY06 level of funding from the state. Uh, just a dramatic, I would say, disinvestment in higher education in the state of Kansas. I don't think you could describe it any other way. Some of it's driven by the revenue and some of it's driven purposefully. Uh, that's been the de desire of some people. That's just hard for us to even imagine how that could be a strategy or an approach that makes any kind of sense. But that certainly, that certainly has happened to us. So we've got, we've got several issues on the budget side. One is we have a short-term issue. It's, and, and John and I spent an hour talking about this this morning. And uh, you know, we got the Kleenex out, we weeped a while, and, and I mean, it's, it's serious stuff. You, you just think about uh, trying to get through a year where you know, we, we missed our tuition collection number by about a million dollars. Uh, we did that because we had some enrollment loss. Not unusual across the system, not unusual uh, around, the around the country. But nonetheless, that was a million dollars. Well, if we take a 5% cut this year during FY17, that's another $1.7 million. Well, you get to $2.7 million in a $110 million budget over a 12-month period of time, or heaven forbid, over a six-month period of time. And you're talking about a very difficult situation for us. So we're trying to work our way through what does that mean. We also, know, we also don't know some things because we don't know if, uh, if it is a $1.7 million cut. There may be transfers done, or there's, there's talk about selling the tobacco settlement. We didn't mention that, but there's, there's that opportunity that some people have looked at. I think it'd be short-sighted to do that, but that could in, infuse uh, several hundred million dollars, three, four hundred million dollars into the budget this year as a means to bridge and go to the next year. Now, that would hurt a lot of programs if that was done, but it would allow us to bridge into the next year. So for us, we're trying to figure out how do we position ourselves to get through FY17, and then in the out years, how do we prepare for 18 and 19, where, where the revenue hopefully will start to flow again at, at better numbers, and how, what do we do to be in, in good shape at that moment to kind of pick up the slack and, and move on and, and be successful as we go forward. So lots of things to consider in that. Uh, we also have a, we have a culture to maintain. We have, a, we have a morale to maintain, and uh, so we have to be considerate of all those things. We have fairness issues as we, look, as we look at the challenges that we have, but we've got to be very, very thoughtful as we move through it. 
I think what you'll see us do is start to make some announcements about what we think is the strategy in the short term, and then you'll see some additional announcements about what we'll do in the long term. And the long term has to involve participation by various stakeholders. We have really strong governance structure here. We've had that for many, many years. And so we'll need to make sure we involve at least the presidents or representatives of various stakeholder groups in our discussions and our conversations. We'll need to seek more and more efficiencies. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we're going to have to spend less money. If you take in less money, kind of like at home, you're going to spend less money. And taking on debt is, is not a solution. We've got to adjust our spending to match up with the revenue. So that's what we're faced with right now. Uh, and, and the other thing, we, and Sean talked about this, we talk about every time we get together, is we want to make sure we tell you what we know. Now, much of this is in the newspaper. Really, many of the things that we talked about are right out in the newspaper, some of the speculation about where people might end up, that's in the news right now. Uh, but we're trying to put it together in a way that, that really focuses and, and relates it to Pittsburgh State University and our future and, and provides context for us and the decisions uh, that we've got to make. So, so we always want to be very forthcoming. And we know sometimes, and I describe the news today as brutal. You see the people writing that down. It is brutal. It, it, I don't know how else to describe it. I'm a longtime Kansan. I love this state. I love this university. We're not in a good place. We are not in a good place. And we have got to figure our way through it. Now, when I look around the room, I look at the leadership team we have, and the deans, and the directors, and all the people we have on the campus, and you can look around this room, I like our odds of figuring our way through it. We have very smart people, very committed people. I like our odds of dealing with it. But that's what it's going to take, a lot of commitment, a lot of innovation, and continue to look forward. So we tell you the truth, be very open about things. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to provide that hope. And that's what you saw in the purple. Right? There, there's hope. There's moderation coming, and that's hope in the years out. Very clear. So, got to be clear about that. Then the third thing is, what can you do? And you hear me say this all the time, and I think more and more and more people are, are buying into this and get this. If you think, if I ask you the question, whose responsibility is it for admissions at Pittsburgh State University? Do not point at Melinda. Do not point at Howard. Right? That's not it. You need to point at yourself. Every single one of us has a responsibility to be an admissions officer. Every single person on this campus can make a difference. Talked to a student in my office today, Allie, and she was an advancement ambassador, well, not advancement, admissions ambassador for you guys. And she scheduled her mom and her twin sisters to come and take a look at Pitt State. They live in Frontenac. She is selling Pitt State to her own family because she believes in this place so much. We need every single person having that feeling about their neighbors, their grandkids, their nieces, and their nephews, at church, at home, at Kiwanis Club, because that's that piece that Sean talked about is we all have a responsibility to make this work here, and we can point fingers at Topeka and say, well, that didn't work well, point fingers at Washington and say, that's not working well. But the fact is we control a lot of this. We really do. We control admissions and we control retention. And we can all play a role in retention and serving our students and supporting them, whether it's at the health center, Rita, or, or Heather in the first year programming and retention efforts that you have underway. Doesn't matter what role you're in on the campus, you can affect admissions and you can affect retention because we're all educators, we're all, we are all admissions officers, and Kathleen, we're all development officers, right? Absolutely, because we have a great story to tell. So those are things I think we've got to keep in mind. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, there's some paths through this. And we have a lot to say about what that path looks like and the ultimate outcome. So as I look at you and your faces, I'm thinking, we, we'll get this done. We will get this done. So I want to make sure you all hear that, see that, and feel that today in our meeting. So with that, uh, let's see what kind of questions there are. And then I've got a, a final statement. Chris has got a microphone if somebody's got a question for any of the three of us. Sometimes we'll do this and people feel like we've just worn them out with all the information. Anybody? Yes, There's a question right back, back here. Charles? Is that Charles back there? It's Charles. <laughs> um, uh, are there any plans to boost enrollment? 
Well, that is our plan to boost enrollment. So you think about Dr. Smith uh, now leading the enrollment management student success area. Congratulations, Howard. Appreciate the energy and the drive and commitment he's brought to that. Uh, Michelle was here this morning at 4.45 a.m. Is that true, Michelle? And Howard was already here. I don't know. I don't know if he's sleeping in his office. We're going to check on that. But our commitment is, yes, we need to grow our enrollment. Our students can help do that. All of us can, but absolutely that's our intentions. Because with additional enrollment, more people have the transformational experience that Sean talked about. And it also helps the bottom line, obviously, and it creates the more viability for the enterprise overall. So absolutely. <clears throat> Questions, comments, or comments? Things we should look at? Yeah. Courtney? Two students in the, in the crowd are asking the question. Yeah. It's she's kind of embarrassing on, all the faculty and staff. Well, she's working on behalf of the collegiate, oh. <laughs> right? You kind of touched on earlier uh, that uh, Congressman Pompeo might possibly become Secretary of the Army. Uh, what would this mean if that position were to open up in Congress, and who might that be filled by? Man, great question. Yeah, she wants you to go. Oh, political my. science major. Yeah. Hey, well, listen, I was a political science undergrad major at Pittsburgh State University, and I don't know. I think it turned out all right. So uh, no. it, was, it, was, it was a transformational experience for me. It was transformative for me. So I hope you're having a similar one. Do you have Dr. Dr. Peterson? Do you have Mark Peterson for anything, Dr. Peterson? Yeah, he changed my life and blew my mind up. So I hope you're having a good experience. We think him. that's a positive statement. It's a positive it. statement. <laughs> we're, we're pretty sure it's a positive statement. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, Dr. Zagorski, those guys had a huge impact on my life. So uh, I think the answer to that is that in, the, in, in the, the sort of technical answer to that is there will have to be a special election to fill that seat if it is vacated. Now, Riley's got some of the details on that, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, uh, th th there is not a governor appointee to Congress. Anyone elected to Congress got there through an election. Are you on or am I on? Yeah. Sorry, excuse okay. me. Um, I think technically what happens, if that happens, whether Secretary Army or anything else, uh, Pompeo or any member of Congress can serve up until the point they are confirmed. So there's obviously appointed and then confirmed. Sometimes confirmation can take two or three months. So they can serve up until the moment they're confirmed. They can't serve in both branches. Obviously, can't be in the administrative and the legislative branches. So they would, he would, or if it's Lynn Jenkins, she would resign her seat uh, the moment they're confirmed. At that point, the Secretary of State has, I believe it's 120 days to call a special election. Uh, that will, there would be a primary for both parties. Uh, and then 90 days after that, there would be a general election uh, between the two primary winners. So it would be just like we normally see every even numbered year, uh, except this would be a special election. Typically, they try to they try to time it up with other elections just to save money uh, more than anything else. But with the timing of this, if you look at someone's, ele or someone's confirmed in February or March, that puts the- 230 uh, days. Yeah, That's basically true. 230 yeah. days that, that you would have a, a new congressperson. And at that point, that, when they win that seat in Congress, they are a member of Congress at that moment, basically, or the next day. They don't have to be, wait to be uh, <coughs> confirmed or, uh, or um, in January with uh, the rest of the class. So that makes for it, a short it, term too though because it it's did. only a two year term. That's right, then whoever wins would be up for re-election right away if they, if they choose to. Uh, so oftentimes you'll see these special elections happen and then both candidates who are in the general election have already declared for the next election as well uh, because it would be a uh, probably just over a year long term in Congress before they have to do it again. In terms of who would run, you're actually answer that question. What's I, I'm impressed with the question. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna give a non-answer. Okay. It could be right. <laughs> it could be anybody. Uh, it's it's a free run at that point. If you're uh, if you're a business owner, uh, if you're a, a teacher, if you're a professor, if you're uh, a member of the state legislature, you don't have to give up your seat to run for it. You can run and uh, it's a shortened, truncated campaign, which is a lot better than the two-year campaigns that we see anymore. And wide open. And wide open, exactly. So that really attracts a lot of candidates yeah. at that point. And that'll be, and that, that district covers Wichita <laughs> primarily. So it's Wichita and not Reno County, right? Reno no, County Reno's in the first now, yeah. But it's, it's probably 10 or 12 counties total, but obviously Wichita is the, the base of that district. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, he still is your district. Yes. We don't want anyone to think we're saying he's leaving for sure. <laughs> right. 
We have no we're special get, information. We're, we're going to we get just, a phone call from his office. I, I think probably I, shortly. I do not want a phone call from Congressman Pompeo's office. All right. Other questions or thoughts? Anybody else? We'll hang around if you want to visit with us. Anybody else? We, uh, I, so I, I close with this then, and just in terms of the national election, uh, we know there's, there's tension around, and it didn't matter who would win that election, there was going to be tension because the, the vote was so close, and the passions were high, the rhetoric was uh, different, obviously, than ever before. That's an interesting word. And so we know that there, there's those concerns, and we're, we're working on a message to get out to campus to reaffirm our values and what we believe in this place. And so uh, you might look for that, uh, see, what, see how you feel about that. I hope that you feel good about it. But we think it's important to make a statement about who we are and what we believe in and how we go forward. Uh, this is a great place. It has a great culture. And we want to preserve that and build on it. So that's, that's where we are. So with that, enjoy the rest of the day. It's absolutely gorgeous outside. So you might want to take the long way back to your office, except for Howard. <laughs> He's got to go back and make sure his bed is made and everything's ready. But uh, anyway, thank you all for being here. Thank you for what you do for Pittsburgh State. Thanks. Thanks to you guys.